Hey everybody, Bob Long, um, Professor Long here um, with your anatomy and physiology video lectures. Um, as y'all guys know, we're on the coronavirus lockdown, so I'm having to do videos and teaching online. That's what these videos are for. For those of you in my class, this is for my human AMP2 course. This is the blood vessels for the circulation lecture. Um, we just completed the heart lectures, so um, this will pick up where we left off there. Those of you who are not in my class, hopefully you glean some useful information. Sort of a disclaimer, these are going to be rather crude videos. They're doing, I'm doing one takes, sort of impromptu. I'm doing them as rapidly as I can so I can get as much space on this board. Whatever I don't get done, I'll be doing from home on a smaller board. Some of you all have seen those lectures already. Um, but nonetheless, um, I'm taking advantage of the time that I have at the school because tomorrow the school is completely locked down and I won't be able to access the campus without some real special permission. So bear with me if it's some kind of crude, if I'm out of... Um, if I'm out of the screenshot or if I step out, I also am battling uh, an allergy that's causing me to have a lot of sinuses. <coughs> I do not have any viruses. I'm not sick. I don't have any fever or any secondary symptoms. But I will get a cough, and the more I talk, I've already been doing about four hours of lectures here, the worse it gets. Nonetheless, bear with me. I may step off and take a quick drink every now and then. So um, for blood vessels. Those of you in my class, we're following along on page 59 of the note set. We're going to talk about vessels. There will be some worksheets coming for you to fill in, or you can use the note set. Those of you not in my class, I hope this helps. All right? So a couple of things you need to know. When we talk about blood flow, arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins return to the heart. Some people will tell you arteries carry oxygenated blood, veins carry deoxygenated blood, and that is mostly accurate. The only time it's not true, um, well, there's two times, but the one we're going to talk about is the pulmonaries. The um, umbilical artery and vein for mom is also, um, I'm sorry, the umbilical artery and vein for uh, baby are a little bit different as well. But nonetheless, <coughs> um, Arteries are red, veins are blue, except for the pulmonaries. Those of you in my labs know that already. And that's because arteries are carrying blood away from the heart. And if I look at the right ventricle, the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood away from the heart to the lungs, where we exchange the carbon dioxide and oxygen. And the pulmonary veins are carrying oxygenated blood back to the left atrium. So we always think arteries uh, away, veins return back. Um, not oxygenated, deoxygenated. Now, there are some, uh, there's some anatomy to arteries and veins that we've covered in lab, and I'll mention them. Um, I'm going to do the anatomy of the arteries and veins, and then we'll talk about some of the differences, um, their functions. For one, we know that when we look at them histologically under a microscope, arteries have a very thick tunica media. This layer is made out of smooth muscle. And that smooth muscle is called the tunica media, which means the, the middle coat or the middle layer. Okay? That smooth muscle allows the arteries to constrict and dilate. When the muscle, smooth muscle contracts, the artery will constrict and decrease in diameter, therefore decreasing blood flow through that artery. If the smooth muscle relaxes, the artery will dilate, increasing the diameter of the lumen, the space inside, letting more blood flow through. This is like turning your faucet up or down or on or off on your sink or on your water hose, increasing the amount of flow. <coughs> the two other layers of the artery that are important are the ones that are filled with the elastic fibers. There's one out here on the outside. It's a very thick and well-defined layer of all these coiled up elastic fibers. And there's another one on the inside. And they would go all the way around like this. This thin layer of elastic fibers on the inside and the outside. I'm not going to draw the outer one all the way around. You get the idea. The one on the outside is called the tunica externa. And the one on the inside is called the tunica interna. And some books also call it the tunica intima. Okay. But I like interna, inside, middle, and outside. And these two layers are a lot of elastic connective tissue. What that allows is when the left ventricle does contract, 
the artery will expand and then snap back. That snapping back is referred to as elastic rebound. The elastic rebound is when the artery starts to stretch and snap back. Now, when we look at veins under a microscope, the vein roughly would, would have been the same size, but when we cut veins, because of their lack of structure of these three layers, they lose their shape or collapse on themselves. So usually under a slide, the vein looks rather um, stretched out or flattened or messed up some. And the two layers or the three layers are not as well defined. There is the same three layers, the tunica interna, the tunica externa, and the tunica media, but they're just not as well defined for several reasons. Number one, veins don't need to constrict and dilate very much. They're not controlling blood flow to, or to a tissue. They're just letting blood flow back towards the heart. And they're not under a lot of pressure, so there's not a lot, of, a lot of elasticity. Nonetheless, they have the same three layers. Again, the space inside is called the lumen, and that's where the blood vessels will flow. I mean, the blood cells would flow, and the lining of the wall is a thin, thin layer of simple squamous epithelium called the endothelium. Anyway, <clears throat> we know a lot of that histology. Now, knowing this is gonna help us understand the differences on how arteries and veins also function. So I'm gonna erase all this, and we're gonna move on. So now, um, arteries carry blood away, veins return black blood back to the heart. Um, there's sort of a, a simplified way that I do this for my classes, <clears throat> in that I like to draw this big circle and it would allow me to cover a lot of ground with one big drawing. So I'm gonna draw the human heart like this. I'm gonna have the arteries coming out of the left side of the heart. And as I go down towards my tissues and break up to the smallest possible vessels, and actually, let me do this in a color-coded fashion. If you started drawing that in black, I'm sorry. But let me do this in a color-coded fashion, okay? So here's the heart, a generic heart. Here's some blood vessels coming out of the left side of the heart that are going to go all the way around the body. And as they go further away, further away from the heart, the diameter of the vessels gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then they'll break up in this little interconnected grouping of blood vessels. It's at these vessels that we get the exchange with the tissues, with the peripheral tissues, and therefore the blood will change color from red to blue. And then as these return back to the heart, the diameter will start to increase. Okay? Now I'm not drawing the pulmonary circuit, but for the systemic circuit, we have blood flowing away from the heart, out towards the tissues, and then back towards the heart. Everything red is an artery, everything in blue is a vein. Of course, we're not including the pulmonaries. So now, there's different types of arteries and different types of veins found in the human body. The largest arteries that are located the closest to the heart, I'm gonna draw a little line here and put a number one. This section would be an area that's filled with what we call elastic arteries. And you can think of it in these terms, okay? Elastic arteries actually have a greater, a lot more elastic tissue and less muscle tissue. We don't want the aorta to constrict. We want the aorta to be able to expand and contract under elastic rebound. So they have a higher amount of elastic tissue. This allows for what we call the elastic rebound. And the elastic rebound can assist downstream blood flow. What happens when the left ventricle contracts is the aorta will expand under all this pressure, as well as the carotids and a little bit of the subclavians, the brachiocephalic. All of those branches closest to the heart will start to expand. And when they snap back, if the um, valve at the base of the aorta, the aortic valve is closed, when they squeeze back and snap back, it forces even more blood downstream. So they undergo elastic rebound. <coughs> Some examples of this vessel would include the aorta, at least really close to the heart, <clears throat> the brachiocephalic, the carotids, particularly the common carotids, and even part of the uh, subclavians. Now it's at the subclavian arteries, all of these are gonna be arteries, 
at the subclavian arteries where we start to transition and once we get a little bit further from the heart we transition away from elastic arteries to where we get to these and this section is going to be called muscular arteries now muscular arteries are going to be all the arteries we've named in lab with the exception of the elastics. That's the easy way to think about it. So that would be like axillary, brachial, radial, ulnar, palmar arch, the, the, um, the splenic artery, the hepatic artery, the common and internal and external iliacs, and so on and so forth. So I'm not gonna list any examples. But one of the things we know about muscular arteries is that they have a higher amount or a thicker um, tunica media have a lot more smooth muscle. This allows for them to dilate and constrict to alter blood flow patterns. Pardon my back, but there's only one way I can do this. So this is where we get to sympathetic and parasympathetic. Under sympathetic activation, a certain number of muscular arteries, those going to our brain, our skeletal muscle, our heart and lungs, will dilate. The ones going to the digestive tract and the reproductive and the waste systems will constrict because we want to shunt all the blood and energy for survival. Under parasympathetic stimulation, then those vessels going to the brain, the heart, the lungs, and the muscles will constrict, and those going to our digestive urinary and waste tracts or systems will dilate, increasing blood flow here to absorb nutrients filter out the blood at the kidneys, develop waste. That's why when you wake up, one of the first things you do is go to the restroom. So that's where the muscular arteries are, and that's their major function. And I'm kind of doing this proportionally, although it's not perfect. This third section here is gonna be what we call the arterioles. So a few things to note about arterioles. They are the smallest types of arteries. The eel means little. And arterioles have the greatest control. It's hard to write on the bottom of the board, so bear with me, okay? They have the greatest control of blood flow to a tissue or over blood flow to a tissue. Gosh, I'm not writing very well. Guys, bear with me. You may have to stare at the back of my bald head, but that's okay. They have the greatest control over blood flow to a tissue. And the reason is this, okay? <clears throat> I'm gonna draw a picture here, I'm gonna erase it in a second. But if this is a muscular artery, and that's the diameter of a muscular artery, and this is an arterial with a very small diameter, you can probably barely see that. If this constricts, it gets smaller, but there's still some flow there. If this thing constricts, it almost can almost completely shut off. We never want to shut off blood flow to a tissue, but I get a much greater decrease in blood flow through arterioles. As a matter of fact, one of the things we know is that the flow is, in for, is actually equal to one over the radius of a vessel to the fourth power. What that means is if the radius cuts down by one half, blood flow drops to one sixteenth of what it was. We get a 16, 16 times decrease in the rate of blood flow to a tissue simply by cutting our arterial in half. So they have a really great effect on blood flow. It's not a linear, it's asymptotic, it's an asymptote. Um, anyway, so they have the greatest control over blood flow to a tissue. We didn't really name any arterials um, in, the, in, in lab, but they're the smallest arteries. Then we get to this structure. Oops, wrong number. That structure is gonna be capillaries. And what we know about capillaries is that they are the smallest and the most numerous vessels in the body. We have more capillaries than we do arteries and arterioles and veins and venules and such. A, uh, so, <clears throat> also, the key for these is that they are the only vessels that allow for what we call tissue exchange. They're the only vessels that allow anything to enter or exit the bloodstream. 
And the reason is capillaries have the thinnest walls. Capillaries do not have a tunica media, a tunica interna and externa. A capillary is a single squamous cell thick. So they are almost, you know, they're pretty much paper thin. And therefore things can diffuse into and out of their walls very, very easily. So it's at capillaries that we get all the good stuff out like oxygen, ions, and nutrients to our cells. Our cells take all that in. They utilize the oxygen, the glucose, the, nu the nutrients, the amino acids, the ions, and they spit out waste. And the waste that they spit out is gonna include um, carbon dioxide as well as biochemical waste or organic waste. That waste has to enter the bloodstream at the same capillary bed that the nutrients and ions and oxygen exited. So it's only at capillaries that we get what's called tissue exchange. We exchange ions, nutrients, and waste and other molecules with the cells in our different tissues. Once it's re-entered the bloodstream, then <clears throat> the blood will flow continually in this direction. And then there's a whole bunch of these vessels right here that are gonna be called venules. Venules are the smallest veins. Nothing too significant about them. And then we get to medium veins. Medium veins have a larger diameter. Um, they're more numerous, or they're actually less numerous, but <coughs> the medium veins are all the veins that we named in lab except for the two vena cavi. So um, subclavian, axillary, brachial, radial, basilic, cephalic, uh, the femoral, the great saphenous, all the veins that were named in lab are called medium veins. And then eventually we get back to here and that's gonna be what we call the large veins. The large veins are the two vena cavi. Vena cavi with an E as plural, um, that would be the superior and inferior vena cava. So what you can do is you can see how blood flows through the tissue. The red is for oxygenated blood. So as blood is ejected, it will flow from elastic arteries, through medium arteries, through arterioles, to the capillaries where we get tissue exchange. And then the deoxygenated blood would flow back through the venules, the medium veins, and then the large veins back to the heart. So some of the famous questions we asked would be, put these vessels in correct order that blood would flow through as it exits the heart and returns to the heart. Or we'll ask things like which vessels undergo elastic rebound, which vessels um, can constrict and dilate to have a large effect on um, blood flow to different tissues to redirect blood flow, which vessels have the greatest control over blood flow to a tissue, which vessels allow for ion or tissue exchange, which vessels are the smallest veins, what are some examples of some medium veins, and some large veins. Now, our book uses slightly different numbers than this. Um, and by the way, doing this little circle here will allow you to answer all the questions on the page 59 of the note set. And then we're going to come back to some a few other things in a mom moment. Um, but basically, there's a chart in the book, and I really don't want you to memorize the numbers because the numbers we're actually going to slowly change. At the base of the aorta, the number is slightly different than it is when we get to the end of the aorta, or actually not to the end of the aorta, but as blood starts to flow through some of the um, arteries, the, the muscular arteries, and the pressure will slowly drop, and slowly drop, and slowly drop all the way around. I'm gonna use a different color for this. I'm gonna to try to use purple so that you guys can see this. But I'm gonna give you some ballpark numbers, okay? So let's say that the pressure in the aorta is somewhere around 110 to 100 millimeters of mercury. And then by the time I get here and I get to the capillaries, I'm somewhere around 60 millimeters of mercury. By the time I, I'm sorry, not to the capillaries, to the arterioles. And let's say I'm dropping slowly. And again, these are all ballpark figures. When I get to the beginning of the capillary bed, I'm somewhere around 35 millimeters of mercury. When I come out the other end, I'm at 18 millimeters of mercury. And these two numbers are important, and we'll come back to that later. And then by the time I'm over here, I'm somewhere around 15 millimeters of mercury. 
And by the time I get back to the heart, I'm at five millimeters of mercury. For those of you that don't know, millimeters of mercury, they use mercury, the silver metal, it's a, it's a liquid at room temperature. When you put it in a tube, if I put pressure on one end of the tube, the mercury will rise and it rises a number of millimeters. So we talk about millimeters of mercury when we talk about pressure. I really don't want you to memorize these numbers. What I'd like for you to realize is that the further away I go from the aorta, or the further I go downstream here, the lower the pressure becomes. And the reason is, blood will only flow from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So if I had two 50, 50, uh, 50 cc syringes connected by a long tube, and they were both filled halfway with red fluid, I could ask you, which way would the fluid flow? And the answer is, it depends. If I press on one side harder, then the fluid will flow from the higher pressure to the lower pressure, and one plunger would go down while the other one comes out. And if I press the other way, the fluid will flow in the other direction. So in fluid dynamics, fluids always flow from an area of high pressure to lower pressure. That's important because if the pressure were higher, say here, in a medium vein than it is here, then blood would be forced to this point and would stop returning to the heart. It would stop blood flow. So we have a decreasing pressure all the way around the system. Now, <clears throat> One of the questions that is asked in the note set on this first page, by the way, is what effect does sympathetic stimulation have on blood vessels? And that is somewhat dependent um, on the type of arteries that we're talking about. Um, there are different adrenaline receptors on different arteries, or on basically all the arteries have two different sets of receptors. There's alpha receptors and there's beta receptors. And then there's two subtypes, alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two. For those of you that go on to the next level for nursing and other um, programs, you'll have to know the details of where all the alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two receptors are. There's a generalized theme that works most of the time. If you look at the Greek letter beta, it looks like a B. So I always think beta is better for blood flow. And if you look at the alpha, it's almost like the A in anti. It's against blood flow. So in general, wherever we have alpha receptors, we tend to decrease blood flow to that tissue. Wherever we have beta receptors, we will make blood flow better, okay? And so you could think under sympathetic stimulation, I want decreased blood flow to a lot of my um, visceral organs of the abdominal pelvic cavities. I want increased blood flow to my brain, heart, skeletal muscle. Anyway, that's just a general rule there are some, some caveats to that, and I'm not gonna get into them because that's not the scope of this course, but sympathetic stimulation can have a different effect. Blood vessels going to where I need it will dilate. Blood vessels going where I don't need extra blood and energy will constrict, okay? Um, well, we're, I'm gonna stop the video right here because I don't want these videos to get too long. There's gonna be a second vessel lit uh, video and possibly a third one. So it makes it much easier for me to upload these videos. It also makes it easier for you to tolerate them if they're shorter. So now, um, those of you in my class, fill in the first couple of pages of the note set, do the worksheets once they're available, and uh, the videos will probably go up before the worksheets are available. I'm working on them. Those of you not in my class, I hope you learned something. I hope you gleaned some useful information. Um, no matter who you are, I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope you learned something, okay? See you on the flip side in the next video.